May 1st, 1986. In a country torn by civil war, 80,000 Salvadorans marched through the streets of their capital city to protest the growing economic and political crisis. Four months before the march, a series of austerity measures were imposed by the Duarte government. They dealt a heavy blow to an already impoverished people. Years of government repression has shown that to protest in El Salvador is to risk one's life. Yet the impact of the austerity measures move people to set aside their fear and make public their dissatisfaction and anger. These measures raised taxes, salaries were frozen, and inflation increased to alarming heights. There has been a 50% increase in gas prices. Basic food costs have gone up 60%. Sometimes I sell, sometimes I don't. Everything is so expensive. More expensive than it's ever been. How are the austerity measures affecting you? A lot, especially petroleum. The government says they need the money to subsidize other things, but the war is expensive, and we have to pay for it. We've been convulsing this small Central American nation for seven years. On one side is a military dictatorship, which has ruled since 1932, protecting the interests of a wealthy few. The regime has ruled with brutal repression of all public dissent. The most recent wave of repression began in the late 1970s. Government forces and right-wing death squads fired on demonstrations, bombed the offices of opposition newspapers, and indiscriminately killed tens of thousands of civilians, including the archbishop of the country. The coup d'etat in 1979 created a civilian military junta. Despite promises of reform, the repression continued, and all civilian members resigned, with the exception of junta president Jose Napoleon Duarte. The United States has backed the Salvadoran government and increased its support since the civil war began. Opposing the military is the FML and FDR, the Farabundo Mati National Liberation Front, and the Democratic Revolutionary Front. In 1980, after all legal means of bringing about change failed, they took up arms against the military regime. These forces are now active in all 14 provinces of the country and have gained international recognition as representatives of a broad-based opposition to the Salvadoran government. In response to these gains, the United States has taken over the training of the Salvadoran army and the strategic planning of the war. Since 1980, El Salvador has received $2 billion in aid from the United States. A condition of this aid has been elections. Despite allegations of fraud, these elections have secured Duarte's current position as president. By May 1st, 1986, Salvadorans had endured seven years of civil war. Thousands of people representing a broad spectrum of society marched, calling for peace. This documentary gives voice to people from various sectors who participated in the demonstration. The government has always made links between the universities and the different political organizations. Charging at the university was the main center of subversion in San Salvador. In June 1980, during a nationwide general strike, the government responded with brute force. One of the targets was the National University. and the university rector were killed in this attack.
Lo que estamos viendo aquí es, es, es lo que fue el Departamento de Ciencias Sociales de la Facultad de Ciencias y Humanidades. What we are looking at is what was the Department of Social Sciences and Humanities. We had the best sociology library in Central America, and one of the best in all of the Americas. The army didn't just bomb it, but after bombing it, they used incendiary bombs to completely destroy the building. Hizo, utilizó bombas incendiarias para terminar de destruir todo el local. Eh, después del cierre se pretendía pues que It was their intention to never reopen it. The students and teachers kept it running. During this time, it functioned in exile in other parts of the city. The university was reopened in 1984, but like the rest of the educational system, it receives minimal financial support from the government. We don't have even the most basic teaching supplies and our school buildings are falling apart. In addition, our salaries barely cover one-third of our basic needs. Given the fact that our salaries have been virtually frozen in the past five years due to the policies of the government. On the other hand, the cost of living has gone way up, over 200%. To keep the National University functioning, students, teachers, and staff have paid for the reconstruction of university buildings. Students who can afford to pay additional fees to cover the salaries of their professors. This is the new humanities and social science building. It was inaugurated in February of this year and is the fruit of our own efforts as students and teachers. De la misma comunidad universitaria. El gobierno pues hasta la fecha ha venido negando eh, eh, este presupuesto eh, universitario. ¿no? To this day, the government has continued to deny us a budget for the university, and their response to our demands has been repression. In 1985, this past year, the government began a wave of repression that resulted in the assassination of 59 students. 32 captured and 11 disappeared. Committees of mothers and families of the disappeared participated in the May 1st march. Along with other human rights groups, they have played an important role in the political dynamic of El Salvador since the advent of the war. Anyone who speaks out for human rights in El Salvador is threatened. But because of the pain that we have felt having lost our loved ones, we have thrown our fear to the streets. We organize marches to government offices, demanding freedom for the political prisoners, demanding to know the whereabouts of the disappeared, and demanding prosecution of those that are responsible for the assassinations of our relatives. We could say that our work as human rights organizations and international pressure have had influence, but it isn't true that death squad activity has gone down substantially. It is a given that it will find dead bodies in gullies, in garbage cans, wrapped up in sacks. Death squad victims whose whereabouts are unknown are called the disappeared. Human rights groups help relatives confirm if their lost one is alive or dead. Searching family members pour over the pictures of unidentified bodies, looking for a face they recognize. There are a lot of uh, death squads which are kind of moribund. Whether they've been disbanded is a different question. Um, and of that, there's almost no way to be, to be clear. It is, it is a case that the number of apparent death squad killings is way down. There are about 29 targeted, politically motivated, killings or disappearances each month in El Salvador.
by comparison to 1980 and 1981, that may look like a very small figure. By comparison to any civilized standards, that's an enormously high figure. If um, death squad killings have settled into that kind of a routine in El Salvador, that is something that ought to concern us to a very great degree. I am telling you the reality of the human rights situation. Who knows? They are being watched. They could capture me any time. But if they do, it will be because I'm telling you the truth. That here, there is no humanism. There is no democracy like Duarte says. Who is it? We've never seen it. As the civil war has intensified, the U.S. has built up the air power of the Salvadoran military, enabling them to carry out daily bombing raids over the countryside. Between 1982 and 1986, El Salvador was subjected to the most intensive bombing in the history of the Western Hemisphere. Bombing is the primary reason why 1.2 million Salvadorans, one out of every five people, are homeless refugees. Many are forced to settle in refugee camps on the outskirts of San Salvador. These people have fled their homes in Guazapa, an area that has suffered constant government bombing since 1982. Fearing army retaliation, this man requested anonymity. The bombing lasted seven hours. All of us ran for shelter in holes in the ground to protect ourselves from the bombs and the bullets. After the bombing, the troops came in and set fire to all of our holes. The bombing is part of a U.S. designed military strategy called draining the sea which was first used in Vietnam. The primary target is the civilian population, displacing them in order to remove any possible base of support for the guerrillas. Even though we are civilians, children, women, old people, according to the government, we are all branded the same. The army, I believe, has a right and a duty to seek out FMLN combatants, to engage them in combat, to encourage them to surrender, etc. Now, when these people are living and moving among their civilian masses in their return, and what the masses are, they're the organized supporters of the guerrilla who do not necessarily fight, but they cook for them, they this, they that, the other. What should the army do? And I will, I will submit to you that, the, that moving them, getting them to... Uh, getting them to a place where they're fed, where they're well taken care of, where they're not in prison, where they're eventually turned over either to the Archbishop or to the International Committee of the Red Cars, is a humane and appropriate approach to take. Pues aquí, te... We are not happy here. We live in the countryside because that's where our land and homes were. Even though the area became conflicted, we wanted to stay because if you love your home, it's a very serious thing to leave. Refugees joined the May 1st march demanding to be able to return to their homes. In an agriculturally based economy, most Salvadorans are landless farmers. They work for the 2% of the people who own the land. We are gathered here today to celebrate an important event in the advancement of the land reform. Land reform has been a promise from the Duarte government. The reform program is designed and administered by the U.S. through the American Institute for Free Labor Development. It has been controversial since its inception in 1980. Anise represents farmers who have been affected by the land reform. 
para nosotros la reforma agraria for us, this land reform is more of a political maneuver than a true land reform and they use it for this purpose they say things to confuse people especially people in other countries like the United States saying that the Duarte government is functioning beautifully from there it looks like a bed of roses here it is a bed of thorns we're grading out land reform right now at about a C plus. Uh, we would hope that, with the, with, with the, that at the end of 1986 that all of the provisional titles will have been issued and that the land reform would be a total success. We all held that if you give the man uh, a little piece of land that he could work for himself, that he'd work it hard, he'd be successful at it, and that he could make a go of it, and that he could then participate in the, the economic conditions of the country, I think has proven to be true. We think land reform is well, very well on the way to success. The fallacy is that economic reconstruction and agrarian reform are possible during the war. Today, only 14.5% of the world population needing land has benefited from the reform, and only 13.5% of the agricultural land has been affected. Those cooperatives that were set up lack adequate assistance and are starved for credit, and former landowners are recovering land when the beneficiaries can't pay. In the 50 years that I have lived, I have never seen a government that has tried to manipulate its people so much. During a strike in 1980, this unionized sack factory, Sacos Cuscatlan, was invaded by the national police. Six workers were killed. These men barely escaped with their lives. We were brutally beaten up by the army. They broke people's ribs and hands. I was hit in the face and knocked out cold. Here, on this site, they shot and killed the man who was in charge of complaints for the Union. They killed him simply because he was a member of the Union. Troubles at Santos Cuscatlan continue. The owners, in an apparent effort to break the Union, have stopped delivery of the fiber needed to maintain production. However, through their own efforts, the workers have obtained the raw material they need to continue. We could produce 4,000 sacks a day, but because there isn't enough raw material, we have to work slowly to keep a supply of what we do have. If we run out of raw material, the owners will shut down the factory. Workers fear retaliation for their actions. Now, there are more possibilities of repression. We have already seen what they have done. The water workers and telecommunications workers who are now on strike have been beaten up. Others have been beaten and captured due to the repression of the Guardian government. In the days surrounding the May 1st march, five different unions were on strike, including the telecommunications workers, Astel. Traditionally a pro-government union, Astel recently suffered the capture of one of its leaders by the police. We've been on strike for 14 days, demanding back salaries the administration promised us last year. In salaries, since the arbitrary austerity measures imposed by the government earlier this year have made it impossible to support our families. The only response we have had is the law of force. Over there you can see not security forces, but forces of insecurity for us. They have locked us out of our workplace and put in so-called technicians from the military. We are not going to sit here starving while they spend millions of dollars to feed the war. The right to strike is included in El Salvador's constitution. Before the march, the government delivered this message. I make a call to all workers and labor unions to take great care at your workplace. Don't listen to people who ask you to demand more benefits and higher salaries because they threaten the country that we are trying to build. The law 
Most of our countries say that we are free to organize unions, but this isn't so. It's a real struggle to form a union here, because if the owners know that workers are trying to organize, they fire them before they are able to do so. Sometimes we have to call strikes to have our demands heard, and the strikes are declared illegal. The government says that we are the destabilizers, but the truth is that we have to feed and clothe our children, give them an education. In 1984, Duarte signed an agreement with farmers and unions. In exchange for their electoral support, he pledged to implement economic reform and pursue negotiations to end the civil war. But Duarte has not kept his word. Negotiations were initiated between the FMLN, FDR, and the Salvadoran government in the fall of 1984, raising hopes for peace. After two meetings, Duarte discontinued the talks under pressure from the Salvadoran military. La Palma were a good thing, and if they had continued, it would have brought about good results. But really, they haven't because of the government's unwillingness. And also there is a small sector that has an interest in continuing the war, so more and more aid will come. Meanwhile, the rest of us are bearing the burden of the war with the imposition of the austerity measures. The unceasing civil war and the austerity measures left the farmers and unions betrayed. They formed the UNTS. In this moment, the conditions of crisis, economic, social and political the social, economic and political crisis in our country has gotten very serious. And this has put us on a path of working together through the new coalition, the National Unity of Salvadoran Workers, the UNTS. The UNTS represents the broadest grouping of sectors in El Salvador's history, including labor unions, private business groups, teachers associations, and agricultural cooperatives. They have taken the unprecedented step of forming a coalition to publicly denounce the policies of the Duarte government. Y en esa primer asamblea se acordó en primer lugar buscar la forma in our first meeting, we agreed to look for a way to discuss with the government the most deeply felt problems of the workers and the problems that have arisen from the austerity measures. A series of requests we made for meetings with President Duarte and the Constituent Assembly were met with no response at all. It was all negative. No fue posible obtener ni una tan sola reunión, todas fueron negativas. Responding to a call from the UNTS, 80,000 people took to the streets on May 1st. was an expression of the broadening opposition to the Duarte government. The participants in the march knew that some would suffer repercussions for their vocal opposition, but they took that risk to make their voices heard.
weeks after the march, nine human rights workers were abducted by the police. Six remain in Mariana and Lopongo prisons. On the 21st day of the work stoppage, the telecommunication workers began a hunger strike. Two days later, 20 workers active in the union were fired. Two days before the march, armed men in civilian dress came to Rodolfo Rosales' home. He was not there at the time. They captured his two brothers, who remain in Mariana prison. Due to continued death threats, Rodolfo has had to leave his studies at the university. Fede Velasquez, who spoke at the May 1st rally, was captured by the Treasury police two months after the march. She was tortured for five days before international pressure resulted in her release. Fede has since been named to the Executive Council of the UNTS.